Amputations <laughs> are not the end of the world. I had a friend that I met uh, socially after uh, screwing around with this guy for several years, distal bypass and blah, 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 and vax and free flaps. And uh, he wound up with a baloney amputation. We lived in Arkansas at the time. Duck hunting is a big deal up there. He said, if I'd have known how good a baloney amputation was, would have been, I would never have gone through all this time I spent with all these multiple procedures. He says, I can sit in a duck blind all day with my foot in the water and it never gets cold. And it actually is not completely, um, that's not completely crazy. You know, there's a huge cost to patients to spend months and months and months to salvage a not very good foot. There's a deconditioning, you know. You, imagine if I send one of you guys, just put you in bed for two weeks, and they say, get up and go to work. You won't even be able to stand up. You know, your muscle mass starts going away immediately when you get off your feet. We stick people in wheelchairs for months. We say, oh, come back and see me in three weeks. You walk in, spend five minutes looking, and say, keep the wound back going, see you next month. He comes back in, it looks a little better. He comes back in the month after. Finally, it heals, and you throw your hands up. Oh, we saved a foot. Meantime, this guy hadn't worked. He's been sitting in a wheelchair. He doesn't have enough strength to hold a pencil in his hand. And uh, it's, a, it's a cost. And one of you is going to figure out where this cross point is between deconditioning and limb salvage versus amputation. Uh, you know, it may be that some of these people would be better off with some food, some exercise, an amputation, proper rehabilitation. They might be better off than two years afterwards getting an amputation after you've done 14, you know, endovascular procedures and a couple of fem pops. So, so keep it in the back of your head. Limb salvage is not the, uh, not the only goal. Obviously, a lot of amputees in the United States, most of them for vascular disease. Diabetics. There's uh, four characteristics of diabetic amputees. They're more likely to be severely disabled. They're more likely to have an amputation at a younger age. They're more likely to progress to a higher level, and they're more likely to die at a younger age compared with patients without diabetes. Should this patient have an amputation? It's not entirely a facetious question. What do you think? Yes, no, maybe. Yes? So why do you amputate somebody? Why do you cut something off? The reason to amputate this would be if it's cosmetic. If this is an 88-year-old woman, she's living in a nursing home in Denison, Texas, where her family hadn't visited her in four years, and she's sitting in the back, she's unconscious. They basically come in, they kind of put some food into her once in a while somehow. They wipe her off a little bit, and that's what her feet look like. She doesn't have any pain, she ain't septic, she ain't walking. She ain't going anywhere, she ain't reading the newspaper, she's just existing. Does she need an amputation? You'll get these people sent in all the time to the emergency room by the geriatrics people. Oh, we've got to have an amputation. The indications for amputation are basically, if I can get it up, unmanageable pain or the limb is a source of an adverse uh, systemic effect, which is usually either sepsis or myoglobinuria. Other than that, there's no real urgency to cut somebody's foot off unless it's for cosmesis. The family doesn't like it. The treatment for the, for the, treatment for the ugly foot that the family doesn't like when they come in every three months and visit grandma in the nursing home and they're calling the lawyer to get ready for, you know, suing the nursing home because they're going to lose her foot, despite the fact that she's diabetic, hypertensive, smoked till she was 88, had three heart attacks and cholesterol of 400. They're going to blame the nursing home when she loses her leg. The, uh, you know, the reason to do an amputation is if, if it's just cosmetic, get a Curlix, wrap it up. If they don't see it, they won't notice it, it looks fine. Put a little Clorox on it, it'll get rid of the smell, and uh, everybody will be happy. This is another reason you sometimes have to cut somebody's foot off, is this impediment to rehabilitation, is the concept they've been, they're stuck in orbit with wound care. They're, you know, perpetually in a vac, or they've had some kind of, uh, you know, uh, skin substitutes stuck on it. And they're, again, they're deconditioning and you're really not getting anywhere. Sometimes it's better, and a lot of people will be like, oh, I don't want an amputation. And they, but they're, they're, they're stuck in orbit and they're not getting better. Sometimes it's best just for rehabilitation purposes to move on to an amputation. Selection of amputation level, you read this in Rutherford, and the reality is that there's not a vascular surgeon out there that cares anything about this. Basically, 
If you've got a Doppler signal at the popliteal artery, you've got a pretty good chance that you're below knee amputation is going to heal. I don't know anybody that does anything fancy anymore. I don't, people don't do transcutaneous oxygens to predict amputation level. You're going to walk in, you're going to look at the leg, the foot's dead, got a popliteal signal at the knee, probably a BKA is going to work. If they got any rehabilitation potential, you're going to do a BKA, take a 10% chance, you're going to have to go to a higher level. <laughs> the only thing on this slide that's important probably is this issue of DVT prophylaxis. The group vascular patients with the highest incidence of in-hospital DVT are uh, amputees. So you do have to kind of keep it, you know, we generally think of uh, amputations. We don't have to worry about uh, DVT prophylaxis, vascular operations, because you're getting heparin on the table. Reality is you probably do need to think about uh, DVT prophylaxis, especially in the uh, amputees. Lots of different levels. Uh, the only thing I'm going to show you here is this concept of the racket. Uh, I think this works pretty well. I orient the racket like this, vertically, on the middle three toes. I'd rather, personally, I, like to, I don't like transverse incisions on toe amps because it, it keeps the toes apart. I want the other toes that are there to sort of be able to fall together. So a vertical incision, which is what a, ra a, a racket amputation is, uh, winds up being narrower between the toes. This is, I, was, I had a chapter in uh, Up to Date on amputations, and I pulled up the thing the other day, and I looked at it, and I went, man, that's a terrible picture. This is what you don't want. In other words, don't make your incision up here across the metatarsal head. If you make this incision for a great toe amp, what do you wind up having to do? A ray amp. You're going to wind up having, and I bet you there's somebody in this room that's done this. They did a little amputation of the big toe. And then they went, damn, I can't get the skin together over the metatarsal head. So then what do you got to do? Cut the first metatarsal head off. If you take the first metatarsal head off somebody's foot, you have screwed them up. Because when you walk, you hit your heel, you come up the lateral side of your foot, you cross the metatarsal heads, and then you lift off your big toe. If you cut off the first metatarsal head, you've totally changed the dynamics of the foot. And if you take the first two metatarsal heads, you're better off, in my opinion, doing a transmet. I hardly ever will do a first ray amp. It really messes up the, the dynamics of the foot and how the biomechanics of the foot. So in, if you have to do a first ray, that's one thing. But don't inadvertently do a first ray just because you cut your skin too, too proximal. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, you won't admit it. <laughs> if you, uh, but don't do that. Do this instead. Make this kind of like a fish mouth in a sense. You know, create skin flap. Even if you have to cut up onto the toe a little bit, that's better than winding up without enough skin and then having to cut the first metatarsal head off. Seems like a little thing. We actually, I had this girl redraw this so that we drew the skin further out so you don't wind up with loss of the first toe. That's what you wind up doing if you take the first metatarsal head. And this guy will come back later with ulcerations because when he steps and walks, he falls across the medial side of his foot. And it's not a good thing because then you wind up with uh, derangement in the other uh, bones and other ulcers. That's so, Ray. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to stop you. Yeah. Because I actually, most of the toe, first yeah. toe amps I've done, actually I've taken the metatarsal head because. Yeah, well, that's, those, I see all those people back and then they wind up losing their feet. Hmm. Yeah. There's a, there are a lot of podiatrists that, won't, that really don't recommend, even first, a single Ray amp first toe, the chance of having a second operation downstream in a few months, very high, hmm. believe it or not. You know, look them up. Yeah. It's a very high chance they're going to come back later with a second toe ulcer. And if you take the first two metatarsal heads and leave the lateral three, yeah. those people are almost guaranteed that they're going to come back and need a transmit. I just won't even bother doing it. Again, think about the way the mechanics work. First two metatarsal and a lot of these people, they're not, let's face it, a lot of them are not going to be real compulsive about coming back to your clinic and getting to the, the many of them don't have great resources. They get stink for orthopedics. They don't, I mean, they're for orthotics. And they basically are just walking around in a pair of flip-flops, and next thing you know, they got a BKA. So think about that when you talk about first metatarsals. These amputations you're not going to do very often. Symes, BKA, you'll do all the time. The thing I want to talk about today was the through knee. I've sort of become interested in the through knee, and it seems like actually it's a pretty good operation. Uh, it used to be, it was, it was not people were not fond of the through knee amputation because they left the condyles on the femur. Has anybody done a through knee? Anybody done one? You've done it, okay. So if you leave the condyles on, you have this big bulbous tip to your femur. And they used to think back in the 60s, that's what you needed, since you had a big surface area 
to distribute your weight over. But it made an unpleasant looking amputation because your prosthesis then had to be wider than your other knee. Nobody wants your, their legs to look asymmetrical. <coughs> the other was that when your knee is full length, when your leg is full length of the through knee, you, if your hinge points are different, you look weird when you're walking. You got one leg with a hinge point where it's supposed to be and then you stick a hinge on the bottom of your knee, your hinge point's kind of down in the mid calf the, for the prosthetics. But there is a way to, the, currently I think a better way to do it is to basically cut off the lateral condyles and then you actually make a cut across the femur itself. So this is a flat surface. Our prosthetics guy says he, he even likes it rounded a little more so it's almost like a Q-tip. So you've got this more narrow surface. And with these modern prosthetics, this is one way this thing works. Uh, this is an air vent right here. You push that air vent when you stick your leg down in it, because otherwise it's a big air pocket. But once you push that button, shove your leg down in it, let all the air out, that thing grabs a hold of your leg. And you can't get the prosthesis off until you push that button again to let air back in. You know, it's like getting uh, cranberry, cranberry sauce out of a can. You know, you have to put a hole in both ends for it to slide out. And you can see the way that hinge works. It's almost like your regular knee in that it folds up behind the, uh, the actual prosthetic itself. So it's actually, the through knees are actually pretty good. Even if you're going to have somebody that's not ambulatory, they have a long moment arm. Uh, and the, the chance of healing is not half bad. Post-op pain is due to a variety of things. The thing you really have to think about is the person that's got ischemic pain. We kind of get in a tendency to think everybody with post-op pain after an amputation is a neuropathic pain, is some kind of a, you know, a phantom limb. Uh, but if you, you can treat ischemia, even if it's doing things like uh, angioplasty in the internal iliac artery to provide better blood flow through collaterals to a profunda or doing a profunda angioplasty. There's things you can do for ischemic pain. Phantom pain is just a, is difficult and there's no perfect answer for it. Uh, lots of complications in BKAs and ISQIP 34 percent. What is the vas uh, what percentage of vascular amputees ambulate with a prosthesis uh, outside the home? A, B, C, D, E. Any idea? Take a wild guess. C, probably not that high. The guys at Oregon looked this up a few years ago, and their, their incidence their, their incidence of ambulation outside the home any significant amount of time was like 12%. Why do people with amputations not put on a leg and walk around at Walmart? What do you think most guys did take a wheelchair instead? Any thought? Huh? Oh, there's a reason they got the amputation in the first place. And it's, which is what? They're, they've got other comorbidities. That's the problem. Man, they can't breathe. They, you know, they're smoking. They got cardiopulmonary fitness is so bad. You know, when you're walking with a prosthesis, it's like walking on stilts. It's work. You're up here balancing on top of this piece of fiberglass. And you got to work. Your heart's working like crazy and you're breathing fast, trying to keep up with it. It's exercise. And most of these guys don't have the cardiopulmonary reserve to support it. They figure out, hey, sitting in a wheelchair with somebody pushing me is, doesn't cost me a thing. And heck, they might even give me a cigarette and a drink if I'm lucky. So <laughs> most people do not ambulate, ambulate outside the house for a vascular. Lamp. Now, tra trauma, tumors, totally different answer. But for vascular, a big fraction of them never ambulate outside the house, even though a lot of the prosthetics people will tell you they do. Chances of ambulating are predicted by these things. If you're homebound to begin with, you will likely be homebound after. If you're older than 60, which is everybody, you got a three times higher chance of not being able to ambulate. Bone knee amputation, you go AK, hardly any of these people can, amputate, can uh, ambulate with a uh, uh, bone knee amputation. Survival, it's not a very good thing to have your leg cut off. You know, it, it's a, Mother Nature is not sending you a very good signal when parts of your body are rotting off. And so that globally, you're not generally doing very well. So vascular amputees, one year above knee amputation survival is only about 50%. So again, you, can you reverse that by doing a distal bypass? You still haven't changed their underlying protoplasm. So, you, you know, being a vascular surgeon is not straightforward. You know, you, you really have to be, and we talked about it over in the lab yesterday, you got to be a cobbler. You're looking at an individual patient and you're looking at all kinds of factors. It's not just what do I do with an SFA occlusion. It's what do I do with this man who lives down here in NASA who's got two dogs and no wife living in a trailer. His only joy in life is his, last, his pack of cigarettes every day. 
He's got no TV. He got no cable. He's, uh, you know, he doesn't have internet access. Uh, what is he looking forward to? What's he trying to achieve in his life? And what can you do to help that person? And that's what you have to do. You got to customize your care for that individual person. All right. Thanks very All much. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Archie.